We do lung screening because of one thing, lung cancer. Devastating. And it all starts with smoking. But cigarette smoking, it's not an easy or clear-cut subject. When you look over time, how it's been pushed on society, when all these great movie stars who I remember growing up with some of my heroes and role models did it, it's hard to say, why didn't you? I remember many of my doctors smoking in the hospital. And then obviously the GIs got supplied with lots of cigarettes. I mean, does anybody look cooler than this guy? Come on, James Dean. And then the real life heroes, sports figures, just incredible. And let's not forget the women, they were targeted too. But for me, here's John Wayne, John Wayne number one the Duke was movie my star good on hero. location. As you can see, making a movie can be pretty tough going. But free swinging He Man parts are what John Wayne loves to play and what the audience loves to see him in. Okay, cut. When the cameras stop, John Wayne takes time out to enjoy his favorite cigarette, Camel. Let's hear what he thinks about Camels in his own words. Well, after you've been making a lot of strenuous scenes, you like to sit back and enjoy a cool, mild, good-tasting cigarette. And that's just what Camels are. Mild and good-tasting, pack after pack. I know, I've been smoking them for 20 years. So why don't you try them yourself? You'll see what I mean. Yes, try them yourself, and you'll discover the secret of Camel's extra enjoyment. Smoke only Camel's for 30 days. From mildness and flavor, Camel's agree with more people than any other cigarette. Well, let's look at some of the facts. Oh, lung cancer survival. The five-year survival rate is 55% when the lung cancer is detected still localized within the lung. However, only 16% of all lung cancers are found at this early stage. And when it has spread to the other lung or other organs, the five-year survival rate is only 4%. And 87% of all lung cancers are clearly from smoking. Lung cancer kills more people per year than breast, colon, prostate, and pancreas cancers combined. The survival rates have basically been unchanged from the 1970s into the early 2000s until a national lung screening trial study published in 2011 clearly documented survival in high-risk patients with CT scanning. There is hope out there. Now, lung cancer is the second leading killer next to coronary disease, yet it is the least funded cancer in terms of research dollars. And as mentioned, it kills more people than the next four cancers combined. What's interesting, though, is that heart disease, everyone knows the number one killer, but lung cancer and cancers in general are catching up. This year, more than 150,000 people will die of lung cancer. That's 430 people every day. Even though we know smoking is the main cause, non-smokers are still put at significant risk due to secondhand smoke at home or at work. And the survival rate, as mentioned, is much poorer than colon, breast, and prostate. More than half of people with lung cancer die within one year of being diagnosed. The population is aging, and 75% of the cancers are stage 3 or 4 with that terrible survival. So for now, men are still diagnosed more than women, but that is rapidly changing. Women are accelerating in their percentage that are getting lung cancer. Black men are more likely to develop and die from lung cancer than any other racial or ethnic group. It's been estimated that active smoking is responsible for most of it. However, radon gas is the second most likely cause. This is more in the northern states. It's an inert gas that comes out of granite in the ground in your basement. The next major risk factor is asbestos exposure, which will increase the risk of lung cancer five times in a non-smoker and 50 times in a smoker. That's in addition to mesothelioma risk. Did you know there was a town of asbestos where the Jeffrey Mine, the largest asbestos mine in the world, ran until 2011? Let's look at the lung survival curves. This is from the NIH in 1970. Stage 1 lung cancer, 40%, 5 years. By 2008, it was up to only 56%. Stage 1s and 2s, and we've seen the data for stage 3, 30%, 5 year survival, leading into stage 4 of only 10% 5-year survival. 
when you look at the incidence of lung cancer by state, clearly the smoking belt is where the highest occurs. Utah has the lowest incidence, Kentucky the highest. Here in South Carolina, we rank 13th. In 2015, the top two cancers in South Carolina were breast and lung, both with about 4,000 cases. Breast cancer had about 18% mortality. Lung had four times that at 74%. 44% of all patients with stage 1 pathologic node-negative lung cancer die within five years of what we feel is a curative resection. So it seems nothing was different than the 1970s until an early study, the ILCAP study, compared chest x-rays to CT scans and found that if very small lung cancers were found, survival was much better. Then the NLSD study came out, a large randomized prospective study, over 50,000 people, clearly documenting a survival benefit with scanning of high-risk patients. When you compare that as a screening tool to colonoscopies and mammograms, you can see that it is very effective. This was huge. As Dr. Mulsheim states from Rush, with this positive trial result, we have the opportunity to realize the greatest single reduction in cancer mortality in the history of the war on cancer. So let's look at this lung screening criteria as dictated by Medicare guidelines, which became effective February of 2015. It took several years for Medicare to agree to support lung screening. They recommend we do lung screening on patients who are age 55 to 77, have been smoking cigarettes for a total of 30 pack years. That's a pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years. They need to be asymptomatic, no current signs or symptoms of having a lung cancer, either still smoking or quit within the last 15 years. They have to receive a written order for a low-dose lung screening CT scan. In addition, they need counseling, shared decision-making before the scan can be done. This is usually with your primary care physician so you understand the implications of what screening may lead to. It's not one study, but at least two-year process of several screens. And smoking cessation is to be offered to all people who get screened. This is a lung rads data sheet that we use to analyze the nodule. This is a system recommended by the American College of Radiology that grades each nodule per the size and character and gives recommendations as to what the appropriate follow-up should be. This has been a great system to standardize the care of how these nodule patients are followed up. There's no doubt that the National Lung Screening Trial is amazingly powerful and we're hoping that it will do more to improve lung cancer survival than anything we've seen in the last 40 years. But with great power comes great responsibility. And what this study has shown is that there's a 25% rate of incidental or suspicious nodules that are seen with screening. These nodules need to be evaluated appropriately and occasionally biopsies of non-cancerous lesions will be done and complications may occur. In order to minimize these complications, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network has screening recommendations. One is that these screens be reviewed by a multidisciplinary thoracic oncology program to minimize the number of biopsies done inappropriately. And if a biopsy is to be done, it should be done with a CT-guided biopsy or navigational bronchoscopic biopsy to best achieve a diagnosis and hopefully improve survival. Let's look at a case example. The patient was a 59-year-old smoker whose primary care physician felt he met the criteria to have a low-dose lung screen. The screen showed a small nodule, but speculated about 8 millimeters in the lingula. If you look at the lung anatomy, there's a right and left lung and two lobes on the left, three on the right. His nodule was in the lower part of the left upper lobe. It was a 4B. recommendation was for a type of biopsy. It was suspicious and he had bronchoscopic evaluation, which is looking in the lungs with a fiber optic scope that's about the size of a pencil. That's able to get into the major airways, but it is not able to get out to the very smaller peripheral airways due to its size limitation. His biopsies were non-diagnostic and a repeat study was done in January as follow-up. It had some growth from the original 8 to now 9 millimeters in three months. 
and a PET scan was done that showed that the lesion was active or hot, suspicious for possible cancer. He was then referred over for evaluation by our multidisciplinary thoracic oncology program. This program is made up of oncologists, thoracic surgeons, pulmonologists, pathologists, radiation oncologists, radiologists, tumor registry personnel, nurse practitioners, PAs, and a lung navigator that are all designed to cut down on the time from a suspicious nodule to a cancer diagnosis. We follow the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines regarding treatment and evaluation of lung nodules. As this flowchart shows, this patient had a suspicious nodule. He was high-risk smoker. It was greater than 8 millimeters. He had a PET. His first biopsy was non-conclusive, and the recommendations for a repeat biopsy. There are many ways to biopsy the lung. Flexible bronchoscopy is very common. It's a low-risk procedure. It's great for the larger airways, but it has lower accuracy to diagnose a small lesion out in the periphery. CT guided biopsy is very accurate, but has a moderate risk of possible lung collapse if your lungs are bad from smoking. Navigational bronchoscopy is almost as accurate with less risk of a lung collapse, and nodes can be biopsied at the same time. A biodesics liquid biopsy is a simple blood test that can occasionally detect circulating free DNA from defects in a cancer cell. Perceptor bronchial swabs can also detect RNA that's associated with cancer, and a thoracic VATS biopsy is a minimally invasive approach to remove the lesion itself. In this case, the team recommended navigational bronchoscopy. To do the navigational bronchoscopy, a repeat CT scan that was very detailed had to be done. A liquid biopsy was also done that did not show any evidence of mutated DNA in his bloodstream. In order to do a navigational bronchoscopy, this is like GPS examination of the lung. It's an adjunct to flexible bronchoscopy. It is done through the bronchoscope, but has a steering system, just like GPS in your car, to navigate to the lesion. To do this, the detailed CT scan is placed in the computer, and a three-dimensional image of the patient-specific airway is created. Using this three-dimensional image, we will plan a map, or ability to get to the spot. Here, the computer system is used to acquire the target in question, which is in the left lung. The target is sized in three dimensions, axial, coronal, and sagittal, that give it an actual volume. Once it is picked, the scan creates a mode where the lesion becomes the center of the entire scan and his body is rotated around the lesion examining all of his airways in order to identify the airway that is leading closest to it. Once the closest airway is identified, points or breadcrumbs are selected in this airway until the computer can sense a large enough airway to generate a pathway. And then it recreates the patient's airway in a virtual image. This is the patient-specific airway. So we're doing a virtual bronchoscopy as to where we need to go in order to get closest to the lesion. We're traveling down the distal trachea. This is the carina, the division of the right and left main stem. We go to the left, into the left main stem bronchus, which now circles around and divides to a left upper lobe and a left lower lobe. The pathway we're going to need to take is going to have to go into the lingula. This is about the limits of our bronchoscope, and beyond this we will need to travel with navigational tools in order to get to the lesion. The airway and pathway will now be synchronized. This is done by using the superdimensional machine. The patient is brought into the hybrid suite, undergoes general anesthesia, has a breathing tube placed in the main airway. So you can just see the little bright light. Yeah. Perfect. All right. And then uh, we're going to put it down. Through the scope, a blue. LG catheter is placed. The patient is on an electromagnetic board, and so we know on three different images where the tip of the catheter is, and we will scare it towards the green target, which is our suspicious right. nodule. Once there, we will use x ray to confirm through this blue catheter, small biopsy forceps can be placed. 
and under x-ray we will take biopsies of the suspected lesion. Here you can see the little jaws will open and close and a piece of tumor was removed. The biopsy was positive for a small focus of adenocarcinoma of the lung. As Albert Einstein said, computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. Humans are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant. Together, they are powerful beyond imagination. So by imaging, we felt that his cancer was a T1, less than a centimeter. There was no evidence of adenopathy and large lymph nodes in either the central lobe or the central airway on PET or CT. So per NCCN guidelines, with negative nodes, he was an operable candidate and he was referred for surgery. He was a copd -er and we felt that minimally invasive robotic surgery was a good approach to this. This allows us to remove the lobe and lymph nodes through small incisions. Robotic surgery has been a great aid to us and has really revolutionized care. The patient's lung cancer was removed. He had a stage 1A lung cancer and his life was saved. So we feel that Obviously, a savvy primary care physician, a good lung screening program, multidisciplinary evaluation, navigation bronchoscopy, liquid biopsy, robotic surgery, and a dedicated medical staff teamed up together can save lives. For more information, please check with your primary care physician to see if screening is right for you. And come visit our website at carpepulmo.com for additional videos 